So, okay. So, uh, so uh, let's start. So, uh, my name is Frank Zamone. I'm the executive director of the Society of Vacuum Coders. Um, we'd like to welcome you to what we call our webinar 2.0 series. Uh, our webinar 2.0 is a collection of 60 to 90 minute presentations that are designed to provide uh, everyone a introduction to topics that we cover in much greater detail uh, in our in-person live version uh, of these tutorials. Um, for those of you who do not know the SVC, we're a professional society uh, that is focused on advancing the understanding of technologies and applications related to uh, thin film deposition and surface engineering. Our education program is perhaps the most comprehensive program in the industry. Uh, in fact, that when you look at the SVC mission statement, it talks only about education. Uh, typically, uh, well, if you were to uh, uh, look at our roster, we currently have well over 50 tutorials that range from half-day to two-day seminars on a uh, very comprehensive range of uh, subject matter. Again, all focused on thin film engineering, surface engineering, and some related applications. Um, once a year, the SVC has an annual event. We call it the TechCon. It's a six-day event, which is uh, focused on three major components, a uh, technical conference, a educational program, and perhaps uh, one of the largest uh, trade exhibitions of its type uh, in the world. Uh, our TechCon was canceled this year due to COVID and uh, scheduled to go off at the end of uh, April in Chicago. And we're currently hoping that we are able to put it on live next May in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, for those of you who do not know about the SVC, let me challenge you to, uh, at some point in time, visit our website, svc.org, and in particular, uh, take a look at our uh, uh, quarterly we call it the SVC Bulletin, which is our magazine. And in fact, uh, uh, we will be releasing the uh, summer edition next month or next week, actually. And, and, and what we'll be focusing on is uh, the antimicrobial and antibacterial properties of thin film coatings uh, as they apply to uh, COVID, a uh, very topical uh, activity. This uh, website uh, or this webinar will be recorded. It will be posted up to YouTube, our YouTube channel afterwards. And uh, the only thing we ask you to do, other than enjoy yourself, uh, is to, if you have any particular questions, you should notice at the bottom of your screen that there is a Q&A function. So please, uh, if you have some specific questions to uh, our instructor, uh, just type them into the chat box. And at the end of uh, the presentation, uh, we'll make sure that we, we address uh, all the topics or all the questions that are asked. Um, I cannot tell you what an honor it is to introduce you to uh, Maya Koblar. Uh, Maya is uh, one of the SVC's newest uh, instructors. Uh, Maya is a electron microscopist at the Center for Electron Microscopy and Microanalysis at the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia. Um, I don't think you'll find someone that has a better set of communication skills and grasp of the subject matter than Maya. Uh, and with uh, 
no further uh, comments because I could probably go on and compliment my for another 20 or five or 30 minutes and then then you wouldn't get the uh, subject matter. Let me turn the course over to Maya. So Maya, please, it's all yours. Thank you, Frank, for that kind of introduction. So um, today I'll start with a short presentation of the full course, which is uh, designed uh, to cover the vacuum, sample preparation, SEM microanalysis, and some software manipulation. Today we don't have that much time, so we'll cover the SEM and briefly about vacuum and sample preparation. So as Frank mentioned, I come from uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, and I work at Jose Stefan Istin Institute, and he's best known for his um, black body radiation, and this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. I work in the Center for Electron Microscopy and Microanalysis, and I've started working uh, in 2014, uh, first on this one, uh, and then moved to the microprobe, and major work was done on this JOL 7600F. We also got a new SEM and um, you will see that a lot of uh, things will be from these two microscopes. When you first see an electron microscope, you think only about uh, this, the chamber and the PC, but there's a lot of things that need to be working before you get a proper SEM image. So the electronics, water chilling, and the vacuum. So here you can see there's a turbo pump below that, a coal trap, and the ion pumps. So why do we need vacuum in electron microscopy? So if we have high pressure, and for example, this is an electron, we want to move the electron to um, for large distances and prevent scattering of the electron. And if we have low pressure, meaning a vacuum, uh, that can be done. We also uh, want to have a stable emission and it is necessary for some detectors. We also want to have a clean surface. So if we have a low vacuum, uh, the water molecules can absorb on the substrate, on the substrate uh, and if we have better vacuum, that won't happen. Uh, the vacuum is also needed in the SAM sample preparation. For example, if we want to do plasmas uh, for the sputtering or um, ion etching, uh, we first need to evacuate the chamber. In the vacuum, you, you will always hear this. So the definition of the vacuum is the combined force striking on uh, the surface area. So the molecules are moving around and this is the definition of the pressure. You have different pressure ranges and in the SCM, we work in the high vacuum and ultra high vacuum. How do we we reach a low pressure. Uh, we need uh, several pumps and every pump is different. It works in different regions and it has different pumping speed. So you can have a rotary pump and after that you need to have a turbo pump and if you have a field emission gun you have to then have a sputter ion pump. And we also have uh, gauges to measure where we are. The important consideration is the leak rate. So the gas load tells you in which rate uh, the, molecule, the molecules enter the chamber. So in the SEM, what I think is the most important is the outgassing. So if you, if you leave your chamber open for a long time, the molecules, uh, the water will actually absorb on the surface and it will later outgas. And if you introduce a sample that is not uh, vacuum compatible, it can outgas and in some cases you can never do electron microscopy. Some uh, helpful tips if you're doing this sample preparation. Uh, this is an experiment that we do when kids come over. So we put the marshmallow inside the vacuum and what it happens is the pressure is lowered uh, and the inside trap bubbles have higher pressure so they expand. And when you introduce air back in, you actually uh, deflate those bubbles. And this is a marshmallow before and after. 
And something like that can be explained in the case of uh, soft samples, so the biological samples. So this is a, a portion of the mosquito eye, and this is a poorly prepared SEM sample, uh, whereas this is better. Uh, as I talked before about the outgassing of your sample, this is corn. And in this case, you can never uh, get the proper vacuum to start uh, the SEM analysis. Uh, what is also to be aware of, don't damage any parts. So this is the glass tube uh, that you are using for um, vacuum where you're sp sputtering. So don't break anything. And um, if you don't have a camera inside the chamber and you have uh, different offsets of your sample, uh, you can damage the, the detector and don't hear anything uh, because so sound doesn't travel through vacuum. So this is the first part. This is a brief introduction. So sound doesn't travel through vacuum. Uh, chamber shouldn't be low, open for a long time. You can have outgassing. Uh, avoid large samples because if you have any uh, water in, you have more outgassing. And use small samples, um, but also if you have really small samples, they can be a problem. If you use too much, they can fly off. Uh, you can see them sometimes in your oil in the rotary pump. And if you have um, magnetic small samples, if they go inside the uh, column, you will have problems with the alignment. You get uh, more information, as Frank noted, on the webinar program on the SVC site. So these are just some of them listed. So now uh, I'll go to the sample preparation. And there are five considerations when you're doing the SEM. So the first one being the size of the sample. So the main thing is less is more. If the sample is smaller, you have a smaller uh, uh, amount of outgassing. And if you have charging, uh, less charging. Again, if multiple samples are used, have them on the same height. So it, the sample also has to be vacuum compatible, which we explained uh, before. It has to be conductive because we're using electrons, which are charged particles. Uh, so if it's not conductive, we will coat them or we can change some SEM parameters. The sample also has to be stable under the beam. Uh, we will show some examples uh, of the radiation damage. And if there are magnetic samples, you can still image them, but you really have to be careful. It mainly depends on what kind of SEM you have, what's the final objective lens, and uh, need to be firmly attached. There are different uh, holders and adhesives, and this is like a necessary sample preparation that you ha have to have. So there are different tweezers, grippers, you have different storage boxes, and these are some holders, uh, and these are the adhesives. The main consideration is they have to be conductive, uh, non-magnetic, of course, and vacuum compatible. And if you're doing anything with water, remember that uh, it can outgas, so um, do put it in a vacuum chamber or um, leave it there to dry for at least a day. Uh, use gloves and clean the sample and make sure the sample is small, but still represents what you're um, what you want to image. Firmly attached so you don't have any problems with the pumps or the resolution on your column. The mounting stubs can be divided into three groups, uh, mainly what they are made of. So aluminum holders, which have good conductivity, uh, low cost and easy shaping. These are some homemade, but you can uh, buy them in any shape. They're good for almost any analysis. Then you have special holders uh, that are made from carbon, which are this. Uh, these are mainly used for EDS um, backscattered analysis. Uh, it's also easy to clean the carbon tape. You just simply polish it. Then you can have um, holders made out of epoxy. Um, this can be a problem because if you use non-conductive epoxy, you have to make uh, good grounding. And if you have a lot of bubbles in the epoxy, you will have problems with the vac vacuum. 
And a note that all the holders, except this one, yeah, the um, epoxy are reusable. Also, there are different adhesives. Um, the main consideration, vacuum compatible, so don't use any super glue. You can use double side tape, uh, either carbon or copper. Uh, fast drying paint is really um, useful also for an alignment. If you have irregular, irregular shape, you can use plasticine. Or if you want to really firmly attach it, like two uh, component silver filled epoxy. But you need to heat it up, so if your sample cannot be heated, then that uh, actually cannot be used. Later, we will talk what happens if you have non-conductive samples. So we'll talk about the mirror effect. So always remember that the sample has to be grounded on the table to let the excess charge uh, go through the ground. And there are different possibilities. If you have a non-conductive um, specimen, you can coat them or you can go to low voltage, uh, which is sometimes denoted as E2 matching. Or if you have uh, an SEM, uh, which can be, um, the pressure can be changed. So variable pressure SEM or environmental SEM. This is also really nice to use. So if you say, oh, I'll coat my sample, you can have different types of coating. So I will explain three that we use. First one is the evaporation. So the carbon evaporation. Uh, this is where we apply current and the carbon thread heats up, the material uh, evaporates, and then you have a nice coating on your sample. This is, uh, all the sketches are exaggerated, so this is not the size of a carbon atom. You have a magnetron sputtering, where you um, have the gold or, for example, platinum target. You... Um, introduce uh, argon ions, and those are uh, sputtering the gold atoms out of your target, and they get deposited on your sample. Another technique is the ion beam sputtering, where you have two ion beams, uh, ar argon ion beams, and you bombard your target, and uh, the, in this case, carbon uh, atoms then sputter on your sub substrate. What materials can you use? Um, well, it can be, any material can be almost used, but depends on what is the price and what you actually want to get. For the SEM, we have five different targets, uh, carbon, gold, gold palladium, platinum, or chromium. So the main thing is uh, depending on what you want to see. So if you want to get higher secondary electron yield for a topographical image, it's best not to use carbon, which has a low yield, but to use metals. If you uh, are also um, not sure which magnification you use, um, there are different grain size. So the gold is for low magnification, then a higher magnification is gold uh, palladium, uh, and then platinum and chromium. Uh, if you want to do compositional contrast, uh, you use carbon because it has low backscattering yield. We'll talk more about that later, but see carbon, uh, the backscattering yield actually depends on the atomic number. Uh, if you use gold, you have a higher yield. And for microanalysis, you can do, um, I suggest carbon because again, it has low Z, but if you use metal, for example, you don't have carbon, uh, just put thin amount and uh, make sure that it doesn't overlap with what, you're, uh, what, you're want, what you want to measure. This is a really good site where you can get a lot of information about almost any target material, um, what can be used and why. So this is an example of a polymer, uh, so a non-conductive sample uh, that was coated with gold and with carbon. So here uh, you can see uh, a lot of agglomerated particles that will, this would uh, normally cause a problem with charging, but gold has really good conductivity. But the problem is you can see the structure, you can see the so-called cracks, and it's not good for high magnification. Carbon, in the other case, um, is not good for low magnification because you can see the change in the yield of the secondary electrons, but in the high magnification, you can observe the true morphology. 
this is another example, uh, a ceramic sample, where we coded five nanometers of platinum, uh, chromium, and carbon. So this is a holder where you can have a surface and a cross section on the same holder. And you can see that platinum is not good because you can see um, it, you don't see the morphology of your sample. Chromium is much better um, and also good, gives good con contrast. Carbon is also good, but you can see uh, it's not that uh, conductive. I said that we have uh, deposited on the previous slide five nanometers. And how do you know how much you deposited? So you can measure the thickness. The easiest way, if you have one, is the uh, thickness monitor control. This is a quartz crystal. It actually oscillates and you're depositing material on the quartz crystal and on your sample. And when you're depositing material on that one, it changes the frequency and that's how you can measure how much material you have deposited. But this can be tricky because if you have a rough surface, this isn't the same. So do think about the sample geometry. You also have some thickness measurements that can be do, uh, done after the deposition, uh, for example, um, gravimetric or uh, using an AFM or perfilometer. And there are many more which you can find on the web. Some helpful, helpful tips for coding. Uh, I like to use the carbon paste, as I uh, said earlier, because uh, you can make really good grounding and it's easy to align uh, it has less charging and you're really near the surface that you want to observe. So you can see the carbon paste is here and on lower magnification. Always do the context first, so example the carbon paste and after that the coating. Coat from different angles. Uh, in some of our holders we have the ability to tilt and also to rock the holder and rotate. Um, and a good trick is to coat only half of the sample. This is where the aluminum foil, go, foil is really handy. Um, because when you put your sample in the SEM, it's easy to check, okay, is that my coating or is that actually my sample? So this is this. Uh, the third consideration that we talked um, when I said there are five considerations in the uh, sample um, preparation is the charging. So I will uh, now talk about the um, uh, conductivity. So what happens when we have an electron from our beam, when it hits our sample, it can produce um, different particles and the charged particles, the electrons, can be the backscattered, uh, the secondary or Auger. There are also different ones, for example, uh, photons, but they have no charge. So one electron, one charge can produce uh, different electrons and also um, we can measure the specimen current. So this is an important thing to understand when you are on the SEM, you usually have a specimen current and this is not the same as the primary beam current because again, as I said, you can get electrons out. So you need to put in the formula the yield of the backscattered and the secondary. This is uh, also uh, interesting because that's how the secondary electrons were discovered. They actually bombarded the sample with electrons and they got more electrons out than in. Later on, we will talk about the interaction volume. Now we just ignore that. We are just talking about charge. So how many electrons are in one picoamp of current that is flowing for one second? There are six million electrons per second. So if you can imagine, uh, you have a lot of electrons that go through the ground, but if you have an unconductive samples, you will have charging, which will mean that you can have a deflected beam, deflected secondary electrons, uh, an increase of secondary electron emission, sample drifting, a spurious X-ray signal or a mirror effect. When you have a lot of electrons, uh, you can uh, put an electric, you, this actually produces an electric field. So you lower the uh, energy of your primary beam and this actually scans the top of your chamber. So you can see the top of our chamber on one microscope. This is the pole piece, the VDS detector, the EDS detector. This is the secondary electron detector and this is where the EBSD comes in. Uh, this is the retractable backscattered detector 
and one note you have a scale bar here this says 10 micrometers so this is not correct and if you have charging the magnification the definition is not correct so you have to be aware of this There are also different specimen uh, damages. So we explain charging, electrostatic charging, uh, different material, different conductivity, or uh, depending on the dwell time. So you can see uh, slower scanning and faster, you can see the change in the yield. You can also have hydrocarbon contamination, or you can um, damage the specimen uh, due to heating. You can see the cracks on the metal coating, or uh, you can do, um, it can happen if um, radiolysis, so the breaking uh, breakage of the bonds um, due to yeah due to the electron beam. So the take-home message for the um, preparation part is um, check the literature what their um, what their proper preparation is. Uh, for example, soft material, biological, um, this, is, this can be a problem. Uh, make sure that they are firmly attached. You can use different holders, different adhesives, make good grounding. And depending on what you want to do, which magnification you want to do, and what kind of image is secondary backscattered, use the proper coating. Uh, there's a lot about tin film growth, uh, so make sure that your surface is not the coating. And uh, now, um, I'll go to the main part, which is the construction and working principle of the SEM. There are different manufacturers, Joel, Thermo Fisher, Zeiss, Tescan, Hitachi, Coxem, but the main principle is the same. You get a uh, nice uh, 3D image, and if you zoom here and even more, you will see that it's um, constructed out of pixels. So. Uh, during this presentation, I will use the simple sketch 8 by 8 pixels where we scan the beam and uh, every uh, pixel can be saved. Usually you save it as an 8 bit, which means that each pixel has uh, 256 uh, shades of gray. So you can have a black one or, or that's denoted as zero or white one. We will um, not talk about the interaction yet, uh, so this will be later. Now we just want to know that the, every image is uh, made out of different pixels. When we talked about the mirror effect, we talked about the magnification and the definition of the magnification in DSEM is the scanning distance uh, on the image. So this is our uh, old microscope, the monitor, divided the, by the scanning image on the specimen. So if you have lower magnification, you need to scan larger sam sample area. If you have higher magnification, you scan smaller area. And remember again, if you have charging or tilt, the scale bar is not co correct. And always on the SEM image, use the scale bar uh, not the magnification because it, remember if you scale your image, your a number, the magnification will stay the same even though you're, um, you are actually producing a magnification by yourself because you're, you're scaling the image. But the magnification is nothing if you have no resolution. So what is the resolution? Is the final spot size of your beam. So the main goal in the SEM is to make this spot as small as you can. And this depends on the microscope that you have, the optics, the sample. If it's charging, then you will never have that, and the operator. For high, so how good can you align the optics? For high-end SEM, it is below one nanometer. There are also some trade-offs. So if you uh, make this one as small as you can, you uh, introduce more noise than uh, current, so it takes some um, tweaking. We will talk about the current, which is how many electrons you have, and the electron energy, which is the speed of the electron. A brief history about electron microscopy. So it all started when Bosch uh, postulated that the magnetic field in the coil can produce the same effect uh, on a charged particle that light has when it passes the convex glass lens. And when Ruska read this, he wanted to test it. And uh, I think three years after that, he got a first image with one electromagnetic lens, uh, total 15 magnification. 
After that, he and his mentor, um, so Ruska and his mentor Knoll, uh, made the first uh, uh, TM, Transmission Electron Microscope, and this is the sketch made by Ruska. And that was the start of the electron microscopy. For the um, SEM, so the scanning electron microscopy, it took more time because um, it was not that easy to make. So Knoll uh, actually demonstrated the first principle, but Manfred von Arten actually developed the first true SEM, and he's also the father of the STM. The first commercial SEM was in 1965. Uh, this was done by uh, Oatley, uh, Oxford University. So his student and him uh, developed a lot of new techniques that actually made this possible. So the components of the SEM uh, are divided into four groups. The first being the gun, the main important consideration is the brightness. Then you have the condenser system, which controls the spot of the beam. You have the objective system with scanning calls, which focuses at different working distances. And you have the chamber where you have the sample uh, and the detectors. We will only talk about the secondary electron and the backscatter detector. So the gun, uh, there are two types. You can have a thermionic emission source or a field emission source. And the purpose of the gun is to produce electrons, roughly shape the beam and accelerate them to the uh, voltage or uh, the energy that you want. So the thermionic actually heats up so the electron can uh, be removed from the surface. This is done by applying an HD. When you press HD on, you apply a voltage and then uh, you turn on the filament, which actually is a self-biased uh, heating uh, gun and this heats up. And when it goes to 2,700 kelvins, your electrons are moving out of your uh, tungsten filament, for example. A field emission gun uh, uses the quantum tunneling effect, where if you apply a potential, uh, and if you have this, this, uh, uh, this one really close to each other, the electrons uh, can tunnel through without uh, having enough energy to actually uh, make it through the barrier. So this is an animation how the tunneling effect uh, is represented. Uh, you uh, apply a potential, so the extraction voltage, and then you apply a voltage that um, uh, speeds up the electrons to the uh, kilo electron volts that you want. This one is also called uh, cold field emission because it's not heated. Uh, this is on our microscope. Uh, so this is um, the filament that is replaceable. Uh, this is the Velnet. It's uh, called Art, um, after Arthur Velnet, who invent invented this uh, self-biased triad gun. And this is the anode. So this is also here. It also is like an aperture because you can see it cuts off all uh, electron, a lot of electrons. Uh, on the SEMs, you use tungsten. On the TMs, you use also lab six. Uh, this is mainly where, where do electrons come from? So this is the spot where electrons come from. So it's much more smaller and that actually depends on the resolution that you can later have. The field emission gun, uh, there are two types, Schottky FEG and cold FEG. Uh, there's a difference because the Schottky FEG has a zirconium oxide pool and you had, have to heat it up so the zirconium um, covers the tungsten tip. Uh, this actually lowers the work function and you have larger emission currents. Um, the, sorry, the, um, you, but because you heat it up, to almost 2000 Kelvin, you need uh, another anode here because you want to remove all the electrons that are produced by heat and not by cold FEC, um, not by field emission, sorry. So uh, the cold FEC is uh, operating at room temperature and uh, you have to flash it uh, from time to time because the molecules uh, will still absorb on the the, um, the tip and you have to apply current so the, you remove those excess molecules. And both of those need a uh, much better vacuum, so ion uh, pumps. Electromagnetic lenses, uh, as I said, uh, the pioneer is Hans Busch. 
uh, and it is made really simple. You use a copper winding, which has low electrical resistance and it's easy to shape. So if you construct it uh, like this and you apply current through it, you will have a magnetic field inside. So if we have a uniform magnetic field, you, we uh, know that we have the Lorentz uh, law. And if an electron flies um, uh, parallel to the, um, to the magnetic field, it won't uh, uh, see any force. But if it goes through an angle, it will spiral through. This is a simple representation. It comes, um, the movement of the electron is not that simple when you put soft iron, when you put soft iron around, so you enhance the magnetic field and you produce a small slit where you, you have the uh, magnetic field uh, leakage. This is actually then your lens. Uh, if you have a construction like this, this is called um, a mini lens, but if you put, put a pole piece, uh, you actually strengthen the magnetic field. And this is the gap of the pole piece. And this is where you have um, the magnetic, electromagnetic lens. The simplest representation about the optics in the SEM is with uh, geometrical ray optics. So you have a convergent um, lens and you can change the focal point. So this is a weak lens, which has a focal point here. If I would turn on more uh, current, if I would uh, put more current in the coil, the focal point can be moved up. If less current, then down. So the, the principle is uh, the same. If, ray goes through, if rays go through the center, it uh, doesn't deviate. If they go parallel, they uh, refract through the focal point. And this is what we will use to actually see what, uh, different, um, the, what different parameters, how they affect our final spot. So the first lens, uh, we said that uh, after the gun is the condenser lens, and this is our source image. And what happens if we change the condenser lens? So this will be a weak condenser lens, and uh, we will then make it stronger. So our source image isn't demagnified, and the final objective lens just simply focuses on the sample, and this produces a really big spot size. If we make it uh, stronger, so our fo focal point moves here, we demagnify the beam and our spots comes, spot comes uh, to a smaller spot. And if we go in further, smaller and smaller. Here, just a note, we don't include the limiting aperture. We will talk about that later. Uh, but what happens if we change the objective lens? Well, the objective lens, the function is only uh, to focus the spot uh, on your sample. So we have to change the working distance. So we go from low, um, um, low work, um, high working distance, sorry. So uh, uh, this is um, the, for example, the pole piece, and this is where your sample is, and we will move it closer to the pole piece. So if you have um, high working distance, you'll have a bigger spot. And now we're not gonna change any parameters on the condenser lens, but only on the objective system. So if you go closer, the spot comes smaller. And if you go closer, even smaller. So the note is, if you want to get the best resolution, you use low currents, so smaller spot size or smaller probe currents, and you use short working distances. But again, nothing's perfect. Uh, lenses and the aberration. Um, Otto Scherzer proved that spherical and chromatic aberrations um, in the, this rotational symmetric lens cannot be eliminated. So in an ideal world, you will have a point source which will, which will be then in a point and you'll get a nice image, but your point source is actually a disc uh, and um, you won't get such a good image. But um, you have uh, four, I mean, we will talk only about four, but you have uh, different um, aberration corrections that you can do. One you already have done if you've done SEM is correcting the astigmatism, which means that your lens can have different focal, focal, focal points depending on the direction. So 
it's like if you would have two different lenses with two different focal points. How is this easily seen? If you go under and over focus, you will see stretching. And this is actually then uh, um, corrected by stigmaters, which are eight um, electromagnetic lenses, but they are not positioned, uh, they are rotated. So they produce um, a coupling effect. You have magnetic field here and here and here and here. So you have a, a stigmata X correction like this and stigmata Y direction like this. The other spher spherical, um, the other aberration is the spherical aberration, which means that if electrons uh, pass uh, the electromagnetic lens uh, in the different um, different area, they will have a different focal point, and again, you'll be uh, left with a spot. This is where apertures come in. The it's only um, this is only a hole made in a, a molybdenum. Um, um, yeah, just in molybdenum. And what this what this does? It cuts off the high angle uh, high angular electrons, and you come with a smaller spot like this. But uh, if you ever um, looked at the aperture on the SEM, uh, you have saw uh, and you know there are different uh, dimensions. You would say, okay, so. Uh, the smallest one that we have on one microscope is 30 micrometers. What if I put like nanometer size of aperture? That would make my spot even smaller, but now you get diffraction and yeah, this is determined by the manufacturer, uh, but you have to uh, know that this has to be changed uh, because you can get contamination on the uh, aperture, which actually makes it smaller. Uh, chromatic aberrations are important because if you have two electrons that have different energy, they will be uh, focused on the different focal point. Uh, this is why you have different types of guns. So the best one would be the cold FEC or a shot FEC using a monochromator. Uh, if you have a tungsten uh, SEM, this is important because then you know if you go to lower voltages, you will have uh, chromatic aberrations that will be taking into account. So use higher voltages or lower the voltage with beam deceleration. You also get, a, uh, the, in this case, you also have a, uh, another effect. You, your secondary electron yield actually increases. So how do you align the aperture? This is a sketch. So if you have uh, the objective lens and the aperture should be below uh, to cut off the, um, the beam. And if it's misaligned, you will see the image being moving. Uh, if it's properly aligned, you will see like a breathing effect. So we say it stays still. So you can, this, this is turned on by Bobler or lens modulator. So this is done by manually moving the aperture in X and Y direction. And um, this is a representation. Actually, this is done really fast and uh, in TV mode. What I would like to note here that the uh, objective aperture is actually above the lens uh, because um, you want to have the sample closer uh, to the pole piece, but the function is the same. Uh, if you have uh, deflectors, uh, so you're not manually aligning the um, aperture, you have double deflection coils, which are this. So uh, this is one deflection coil on this uh, below here is another one. So what do these coils do? They produce shift and tilt of the beam. So why is this important to note? So if you're uh, aligning the aperture, not with mechanically, but with your um, uh, buttons or yeah, uh, deflectors, you're actually changing the center. So you are putting the aperture in the center, but your stigmata center actually changes. So you need to uh, correct also this one. Uh, the scanning calls and the image formation. So um, there are deflector coils which push the beam in X and Y, so sides from side. And if you want to decrease the magnification, what you can do, you can increase the working distance or you can turn off the immersion more and you can then deflect the beam uh, more. Later, we'll talk about the detectors. So 
Now uh, we, we have come to the interaction volume part where we will talk about uh, the image formation. So in each pixel, we will uh, acquire uh, either a topographic image uh, taking secondary electrons into account or a backscattered image. So this is a, a nice image from uh, Casino, which is a software that is freely accessible. And if you have a, a 20 kilo electron volts, and this is a gold sample, your interaction volume, so your sample, uh, your electron will go inside the sample. Uh, you, it will scatter, and some uh, will be back scattered out, where they will produce also secondary electrons. Others will be absorbed, and you also have different processes in it, but we'll only talk about this too. If you have a lower uh, energy, two kilo electron volts, this. Uh, is smaller. So the simple sketch that we'll use is a teardrop shape. So the backscattered uh, comes from this area and the secondary from this one. The definition is that the backscattered electrons are the primary beam that has uh, been uh, scattered uh, from the atoms of the sample and has come out of the sample. So these are the red ones. Uh, the secondary electrons are generated as uh, secondary. So either your beam hits uh, an atom and this uh, causes the electron to be moved out from the outer valence bond and you get those secondary electrons or your backscatter electron that is actually taking, uh, getting out can also produce a secondary electron. By definition, the secondary electrons are below 50 eV and backscattered are above 50 eV and below your uh, keV voltage. And this is all done by this uh, freely available software. Uh, as I said before, um, it's nice to see that the backscattered uh, electrons are not scattered like uh, in one uh, scattering event, but actually multiple scattering events have to happen that your electron is backscattered. So there are two types of SEM image, the secondary electron where we will talk about the yield, which is important, and the backscattered. Um, this is defined, so the yield is defined as how many electrons you get per excited electron, and this is this, and the backscattered, again, uh, this is this. The image looks differently uh, because the secondary have lower energy, 50 eV. Uh, they come only from the top surface. They are produced actually inside the, um, uh, the sample even, uh, but they don't have enough energy to go out, so you, all, you only uh, observe the sample uh, on the surface. So. Uh, if you uh, want to do the backscattered electron image, you can see the difference in the atomic number. So uh, these uh, is low Z and uh, this more bright has higher Z because the backscatter coefficient actually rises. Um, so this is an animation showing your primary electron beam hits out the electron. This has low energy and you, um, that's why it's coming only from the surface. Whereas if it's a backscatter, it will scatter because of the nucleus, the positive charge, and then you have multiple collisions where it scatters off. Um, the detectors that we use uh, for secondary are Everhard Thorny, which has high resolution, strongly topographic sensitive, little element sensitive, and is sensitive to charging. So the detectors can be in the chamber or in the column. You apply a positive voltage and your electron is attracted to that detector. Uh, if you have an um, in-chamber detector, um, and this is the image, sorry. If you have it in-chamber, it actually spirals through the, um, the magnetic field that you have and goes in the detector. Either you have a bias voltage and uh, you can also have an, some kind of electrostatic lenses. Uh, the main difference is uh, here you cannot see that nice um, shadowing effect where here you can know that the detector was positioned on this side because this is uh, brighter. Uh, this one actually because of its uh, spiraling isn't observed. Uh, the backscattered electron uh, has lower uh, resolution, but is uh, sensitive to the atomic number and is less sensitive to charging. But again, if you want to do a, the true atomic number, you have to have polished samples. So um, 
sorry. So this is a secondary electron image, uh, but on the backscatter, you can see that uh, some inclusions here are brighter. So this is uh, a different material. The backscatter don't need a bias voltage because they have uh, enough energy. So they go uh, to the detector and you measure uh, the charge. This is the um, backscatter detector that we have on the GEOL. It's um, segmented in two directions. So you can get a compositional image or a topo image. Um, there are different manufacturers. Uh, on Thermo Fisher, you have a concentric ring, but the same principle. So the outer ring is more topographic. The inner, the inner ring is more compositional. So how is that observed on the image, uh, depending on the voltage? So we have uh, thin uh, flakes. Uh, this is um, a thin flake of um, silver. If you use 20 kilovolts, you won't be able to see it. If you lower the voltage, you will see it uh, nicely. And the other way around, if you want to see something below the structure, you have to apply higher voltage. Uh, the same goes for some chips. So the electronics are actually covered. So you need to use higher voltage to see what's underneath here. If you have electrical charging on specimen, even though if it is conductive, uh, you can see bright edges. So without lowering the energy, you can lower the probe current uh, and you can get a nicer image. Uh, charging um, conditions can also be changed by smart scanning. For example, you don't want to change anything, the voltage, the current. You change just uh, the shorter dwell time, but you get more noise. So you just put uh, an integration and the image is better. You have less charging. Uh, the depth of field is also a neat thing that is observed in the SEM. And this can be achieved by changing the aperture. Uh, in this case, we changed a small aperture to a big aperture and you can see what happens. So if we, ha we are really close to the pole piece uh, and a small aperture, we see all this in focus, but this is out of focus. If we use larger aperture, our final uh, spot is like this and we can only see a smaller amount of um, a mosquito in focus. But remember, you're here uh, also limited with the resolution. Uh, but the best thing, if you want to have really high depth of focus, is to use larger working distances and smaller aperture. Because uh, here you can see also everything in, uh, is in focus. What about charging on uh, hard uh, semiconductive material? Uh, when you're starting the SEM, maybe you have a small amount of charging, but by time, uh, this comes a severe problem. So we have a semiconductive material and you have low energy. Uh, this um, it can be changed by putting more energy on your electrons and it won't be deflected that much. So um, this one keV image is not good, but after the charging, you put it on 15 keV, you still can get proper images. The other way around is if you have biological soft material. So never go uh, on 15 keV because you have a lot of charging. And uh, in biological material, we start on low keV. So that's uh, below five. So here you can see nicely the stomata leaf, which are not uh, seen that good here. So the take home uh, information, there are different parts. Uh, we have discussed everything from the gun to the detectors. Uh, hopefully you know uh, some parts have to be aligned. Uh, there are also different detectors that can be changed. Uh, you know about the electrons and the interaction and the interaction volume and that you can change some settings. So voltage, current, working distance, aperture, scanning speed. So this was a short introduction of the full course uh, and I haven't talked about uh, microanalysis, EDS, VDS, EBSD or any of the simulation softwares. There are many more special topics on the SEM, the, on the SEM also. Uh, to finish, I would uh, recommend uh, some of the books, mainly the, uh, the fourth edition of the Goldstein. 
And uh, if you're not that much into the books, you have a really nice website uh, on the Australian Microscopy Society. Uh, they have a virtual SEM and also virtual TM. Uh, this was um, my practice in 2016. Now they improved the website and you have a new virtual SEM. Uh, I would also thank Dave um, for finding me and Frank for this opportunity. My mentor, uh, Professor Miran Cech, uh, our service, so Mattia, Sasha, and Steve, uh, and my coworkers, uh, Sandra, Matias, Boya, and Nadezhda Mateka, and also the people who I've worked with. So some of the images were actually from, our, um, from my SEM training. So these are the people that were on the trainings and actually did some of the images. And now I uh, can stop the presentation. If there are some questions, um, we can answer them now or you can uh, send them by email. So Maya, uh, let me thank you for an outstanding and informative uh, presentation. Usually uh, uh, I might have fallen asleep at my advanced uh, age, but uh, I actually took a very copious set of notes and it was an outstanding presentation and, and certainly the, the quality of the graphics was uh, unlike anything I've ever seen. So, so on behalf of the SBC, uh, let me thank you. And if you open up your Q&A uh, window, you'll see that uh, we actually mm -hmm. have uh, a question coming in. Yeah. So how do SEM images, how to do SEM images uh, which are coated on glass with multi-layer coatings? Okay, so if you have glass, which is a non-conductive material, then you have a problem. You have to put um, nice grounding. So um, if I have glass uh, and something that I want on, I put um, the um, tape uh, really all around it or carbon, um, as I've said, carbon um, paint. So you need to make uh, good conductivity and um, make sure that the glass is smaller as possible so um, you don't have charging effect. And um, I don't know if you uh, remember, I showed you um, the tips and tricks about sample preparation. You saw some sample that was charging and I said, a really neat idea is to put carbon uh, paint near because near the paint, you won't have that much charging and you can observe the SEM. If you go farther away, uh, you will have more charging. Um, Oh, the cross-sectional information. Okay, that's easier because then you use a holder for a cross-section and then you just apply um, the, the paint on the edges. And you will see if you uh, do the alignment on the edges where you have the carbon coating, uh, carbon paint, sorry, carbon paint, you will align it and then you just go in your sample, do the images and you won't have that much charging. Uh, the further you go, uh, more charging you have. Uh, and then depends on the microscope you, which you have, if you can do any low voltage microscopy and depends also what multi-layer you have, so. It's not that simple. So when I get a new sample, I usually uh, do at least two different preparations and I change all the parameters that I can so to see if it actually worsens the image or if it gets better. Dr. Kumar, I'm going to allow your microphone so you can save your fingertips from, from typing. So your microphone, Dr. Kumar, is enabled. So. Hello. Hello. Very good. Good, good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Myself, Dr. Pravin Kumar, ma'am. I required uh, to understand the single layer coating of SiO2 on glass. How to do the same image of that one? 
Okay, so uh, you have a non-conductive substrate and you have a um, semi-conductive uh, SeO2 coating. So if you want to do the cross-section, I would um, um, glue it on a holder for cross-section and I would apply um, the um, platinum, uh, no, not platinum, the carbon paint, sorry. And um, if you can, if you have coders, also apply uh, a coating on top. So uh, if you want to see uh, like nanometer grains, um, you put chromium or uh, tungsten or carbon, that would be great. And what, the top most of the top most of the layer of PSI, what do we have to deposit this thing or uh, bottom most? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is we have to deposit the chromium or platinum on the topmost of SiO2 coating or the bottom of the bottom of the coating of the substrate on glass? No, no, no. You're you're depositing on the top. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, because you want to have good conductivity. Maybe you don't have to. That's why I say I use a simple trick because uh, we have SEMs per hour. So when I have a session, I need to be prepared. That's why I have SEM samples that are half coded. So uh, I don't know if my coding will actually improve my SEM image or if that will interfere. So I would be observing the morphology of the coding. Really, the session was very good, ma'am. I am very much interested that the SVC was conducting this kind of uh, uh, live, live seminars. I am very much interested. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Does not appear that we have any more questions, Maya. Great. Everybody understood. So let me, uh, Maya, if you could advance to your last slide. Mm -hmm. so, so, so again, to our, our attendees, let me, on behalf of the SBC, thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, scratch the surface a little bit on a very complicated and interesting subject uh, that's presented by Maya. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Maya will be treating this subject on effectively a full day course uh, in Nashville at our TechCon. And again, if there's an interest in, in learning a bit more uh, on this particular subject or on the vast range of subjects, consider coming to the TechCon and more importantly, uh, consider uh, sitting in on this very eclectic series of webinars that we'll be putting on. There's no charge. We promise not to annoy you too much now that you've given us your email address, uh, but we'll just keep you posted on uh, the activities of the SVC. So again, let me thank you all for the time you spent. Maya, let me thank you for the time spent preparing an outstanding presentation. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Be safe, wash your hands, wear a mask. Let's get through this, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, safe and sound. Thank you all.